Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rock Baptist Church this morning. Um, my name is Heather Duke, and I'm a member of the church family here. A particular welcome if you are new or visiting us this morning. It's really lovely to have you. Um, and welcome to those of you on Zoom. I know that we have a number of um, church family members who are at home and well, so you'll be in our prayers this morning. Let me pray for us as we begin. Heavenly Father, as we meet this morning, we pray that you would quieten our hearts before you as we worship you together. You know everything about each moment of this past week, from the most difficult to the most joyful, and we thank you for being an all-knowing God whose love for us is unstoppable. We ask for humble hearts as we hear from you. Would your words and the Holy Spirit unmask any self-reliance within us, and would those who are weary find rest in your presence? We particularly lift up those within our church family who are at home feeling unwell this morning. Bless our time together, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, um, Mike Partridge, our minister, began our series in the book of Jonah. And Jonah is a story that lots of us probably feel we know well. Can anyone tell me what extraordinary thing happens to Jonah? Who knows what happens to Jonah? Mary, do you want to tell us? He's swal swallowed by a fish, isn't he? Which is pretty extraordinary. But what we also saw last week was a prophet who was running from God, hiding, making mistakes. And yet we saw a God who weaved the facts of the story together in his sovereignty to bring about his purposes. And also a God who responded with grace, even in Jonah's mistakes. And perhaps we can think of times over the last week where we have run from God, made mistakes, whether at school or at work, an unkind word to another, or just not done as we know God would like us to do. But we have a faithful God, a God who is unchanging, regardless of how we behave. And in Psalm 95, we see this beautiful picture of how we should respond to a faithful God. We see a picture of worship that comes out of adoration and worship that comes out of humility as we bow down before him. And Alice is going to come and read the first seven verses of Psalm 95 to us. Psalm 95, verse 1 to 7. Come, let us sing to jo for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and exalt him with music and song. For the Lord is great, is the great God, and the, great, and the King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Thank you, Alice. Let's respond to that um, psalm in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are eternal, ever-present, perfect in knowledge and wisdom, absolute in power, spotless in your purity, completely just and righteous, beautiful in your glory. You are all of this, yet our praise falls so short of your reality. As we meet together this morning, please accept our praise through the merits of Jesus, our Saviour. We confess the blindness of our understanding, the stubbornness of our will, the foolishness of our thought life, and the addiction of our hearts to the things of this world. Yet you are full of truth and grace. We praise you that in Christ your grace abounds to us. Amen. Let us sing now of God's faithfulness in the words of our first song. Let's stand to sing.
of the many ways that God has shown his faithfulness to us as a church is to bless us with midweek groups um, that we run in the local community. And Joan Russell has very kindly agreed to come up and tell us about one of them. Thank you, Joan. So for those of us unfamiliar with diamonds, do tell us what the group is about. Well, it's a short explanation. It's Rock's Over 60s Club. But that doesn't mean if you're under 16 you turned up, I'd turn you away, because it certainly wouldn't. Uh, we meet in Litchfield Hall on alternate Friday afternoons between 2.30 and 4. If I remember correctly, it was started by Al McGuinness when he was Rock's evangelist many years ago. And it was an outreach to the elderly people who live in the many flats that are on Litchfield Road. Sadly, over the years, we've lost all except Mary. We've never been able to recruit any new people. So it really is Rock's over 60s club now. And most of us are part of Rock or they're friends of ours. And what we do is we start with tea and cake and then we have a thought for the day. And oh, I, I, It's a wrong title really, because it's much more than a thought. Uh, the things, sort of things we've done over the years are the Christianity Explored, God's Big Picture, I'm a great favourite of that. And at the moment we are looking at great hymns and their stories. This was one of the ones that we've done. And that can be very useful. When one of our number recently said that she told her sister she didn't need to worry about dying because she was a nice, good person. Um, so the next week I did uh, Amazing Grace and used that to teach that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Um, and then after that we play Scrabble. We're, we're almost a Scrabble club these days, but other games are available if you like. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. And tell us what's been happening over the last couple of years with the pandemic and then in the last few months. Uh, well, the pandemic in a way, I mean, we, we had to stop. We were not allowed to use the Litchfield Hall, so we weren't able to meet. Uh, obviously, we kept in touch by telephone with those who were part of Rock, uh, and as, as they were friends anyway, we would, we were in touch with them. And then, when we were able to go back into Litchfield Hall, we went back more or less to normal. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what's happening. Yeah. And how can we pray for the group going forward? Well, we can always pray for our new members. If everyone who's been regularly Recent. If everyone who's been recently was regular, there would be 10 of us, uh, but it's often a lot lower than that. So we can pray for new members and for those who come to be committed. We would love to see those in the group who aren't committed Christians to become committed. Some are regular churchgoers, but they don't seem to have a, a clear understanding of the gospel in spite of all the teaching they receive. And the other thing is for our health, because every one of us has got health problems, and some quite serious, so that has an obvious effect on it. Thank you, Joan, that's great. Let me pray for diamonds now. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us good work to do for your glory. We lift up to you the Diamonds Ministry now and praise you for enabling the group to start meeting again and for the encouragement that that has brought to Joan and Rachel and the other members who come along. Would your hand be on this ministry, Father, enabling it to continue and grow its numbers? Would it be a source of great comfort and encouragement to those who attend, particularly for those who are lonely and struggling with ill health? Each and every member of this group is made in your image. We pray that through diamonds you would draw more people to yourself as Christians in the group reach out to others with the good news of the gospel. We pray that you would bring existing group members to a saving faith in you. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we run these groups during the week, not because we are good people. Um, we always have mixed motives if we're left to our own devices, but we do it because God first loved us as an overflowing of that love. And when I first became a Christian, when I was 20, God used some words from 1 John in the Bible to totally redefine 
my view of love. And if you're not yet a Christian here this morning, perhaps a younger person thinking through the Christian faith or someone who's just not sure, these radical verses get to the real heart of what Christians believe. So I'm going to read those to you now. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. How wonderful that God's love doesn't hinge on what we do, but on what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. A sinless, perfect saviour sent into the world to live amongst us, to die on the cross, taking all of our sin, all of our wrongdoing on himself, and then to conquer death for those who trust in him. And we're going to sing our next two songs now, which talk of this, which sing of this wonderful rescue plan, Jesus our Rescuer. Let's stand to sing.
please take a seat. I'm going to hand over to Ross now. This time last week I was on an aeroplane and behind me were sitting two small children. And sure enough, about five minutes after takeoff, the question came up. Are we nearly there yet? They had fantastic parents and the parents reached into the backpack and brought out some colouring in for the children to do. About 10 minutes later, are we nearly there yet? And the parent reached into their backpack and brought out something else for that child to do. Now the flight lasted about a bit over an hour. But you could tell as the flight went on that this child was getting more and more desperate. And sure enough, about 10 minutes before landing, this child just burst into tears, threw themselves all over their parent and started screaming. And the dad said, right, get out the iPad. And I have to admit, at that moment, I could think of several creative ways to use an iPad to make that child quiet. But it occurred to me that that family took that child who was tired and hungry and miserable. I left them. I walked out the door of the aeroplane and didn't see them again. But the parents stayed with the child. Somehow they got them into a car, still upset. Somehow they got them all the way home, still making a fuss. Somehow they got them washed and into pyjamas and into bed. Whew. And then the next morning, that child woke up, probably still feeling a bit rough, and the parents were still there, still looking after them. We've been talking about God's faithfulness, the way God's love stays with us through all these things. And I think you just get a little glimpse of uh, what it's like for human parents to show that kind of faithful love. But it's just hard for us to imagine how big God's faithfulness is. And there's a really nice verse here in 1 Thessalonians, which talks about God's faithfulness, and it talks about how God rescues us. And it goes like this. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit and mind and body be kept perfect for when Jesus Christ returns. And he will do this because he is faithful. God is faithful. He will do it. That talks about God being faithful with us for our whole lives. Now, I was trying to think, how do we think about someone's whole life? About God being faithful to us and being a rescuer for us like that, for our whole lives. Um, so I think it helps to shrink life down a bit. So let's put one year onto a metre. So here's a, a, a metre stick. And I've drawn the months on there, and you can imagine I can get there with a pencil and draw little lines, and you see all the days, all 365 days over a year. So one year is like taking a big step. Now I'm wondering, is there someone here who's younger than 10 who can do big steps? Who can do big steps? Yeah? Excellent. Jackson, come up here. Now, Jackson, how old are you? Nine. Nine. Right, let's face this back a bit. I think if you come with me, you're going to start there. You're going to do nine big steps, and we're going to clap you as you go. Are you ready? Off you go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well done. Thank you. That was Jackson's life, flying past your eyes. Nine years of Jackson's life and all the things that happened. And God was faithful through all of those nine years. Now, I'm looking for someone who's more than 20, who can say, yes, God has been faithful to me my whole life. Can I have someone who's more than 20? Thank you, Joan. <laughs> now, Joan, I'm not going to ask you the number. 80. <laughs> hey, we're going to clap you for 80 big steps. You can go all the way around the church. It's going to take a couple of times. We're going to clap you all the way. Off you go.
We can't imagine 80 years of life passing by like that, but imagine everything that God has been doing every day in Joan's life. That is amazing. And if you really want to have your mind blown, here is a verse from Psalms. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. A thousand generations. I reckon that's about 25,000 years. 25,000 years of God being faithful to us. Now, if you imagine it as like this stepping stick, that'd be like taking big steps from here all the way to Ely. That would be God's faithfulness. And you see the whole 25,000 years flying past. It's hard to imagine just how faithful God is. Now, you might think that walking all those 25,000 steps to Ely would be difficult. Perhaps if your surname is Horton, you wouldn't think that's quite so difficult. But we know that life is difficult. And I was thinking, well, how can we understand that? God is faithful through our whole lives, but life is also difficult. It isn't just a matter of walking around the room, getting some claps. What if we don't walk along the ground? What if we go up? instead, because I think up is harder than along. Who here is good at jumping? Yes, here comes him. Let's just, oh, put the problem in the now. So you stand next to the stick, face everyone, and like do the biggest jump you can, and I'll see where your feet get to. That's pretty good. So if I did the right way around, that would have been made it up to April. Excellent. Would anybody like to try and beat the record of April for a big jump? Yes. Come and stand next to the stick. Now, if you stand on this side, I can see how high you jump. Off you go. That got your feet up to June. Well done. Who else? Uh, Ruben, do you want to have a go? See if you can beat June. That was also about, yeah, May 27, thereabouts, just before June. Excellent. Now, Jackson, you did some good walking. Um, what if we went for a bigger person? Surely bigger people can do bigger jumps. Is there a big person here who can do a big jump? Seth. <laughs> Ryan, okay. Ryan, who was born with springs in his legs. Right, Ryan. You face everyone. Do the biggest jump you can. Oh! That was about June the 20th. Well done, Ryan. That's a new record for jumping. Go back. Give him a clap. So we know that God's faithfulness lasts through all our lives. And we know that God's faithfulness takes care of all the times that are difficult. And we can't imagine just how much God's faithfulness can do for us. So here's a final verse. How high will God's faithfulness last for us? In Psalms it says, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Let's stand and sing a song together about God looking after us. Thank you.
actions from the Harks and Hattie and Ryan. Thank you for that. I'm going to hand over now to Matt Peckham, our Assistant Minister, to um, give us our notices before Rock Bible Church leaves. Great morning, everybody. Thank you, Heather. Um, just a couple of notices. Um, this week is a prayer meeting on Thursday, so your home groups won't be meeting. Um, unless you decide to do so, do so, you could, I suppose. Um, but we don't do home groups normally when there's a prayer meeting. And it's going to be on Zoom this Thursday, 8 o'clock. So pop that in the diary, um, especially home group leaders might need to know that. And secondly, um, say the date. So Keith has correctly um, uh, adjusted my original notice, which said book now. You can't book now, but book it in your diary, was what I think I meant. So Keith, you did well there. So say the date. It sounds like a long way away, but believe me, it will creep up, and so will other things, and other people saying, what are you doing on the 7th to the 9th of October? And you can say, I can't make it then, it's our church weekend away. So put that in the diary. And uh, I guess the third notice would be we are meeting again here this evening at 7 o'clock. We're going to carry on in the book of Micah. So do join us then. Thank you. Great. Well, it's now time for Rock Bible Club to um, leave for their classes. I think that Stepping Stones and Rockies are combined today. So um, let me pray for you before you go. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have blessed us with so many young people. I really pray for them now that they would have a wonderful time, lots of fun together, and that they would learn more and more about you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a short break while um, the children leave. Well, um, 
Through the pandemic, we have prayed for the NHS. We are blessed to have a number of um, key workers in our congregation. And we've also had church family who've been treated under the NHS during the course of the last few years. And we'd like to keep praying for the NHS now. So I've asked Cathy Joan to come up and to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Cy Duke and our Carolyn have given input for prayer points on the challenges the NHS currently faces. These include concerns over COVID restriction easing, long waiting lists, providing health care while there are still many COVID related staff absences, and mental health. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you showed us your great mercy and grace, even when we didn't know we needed it, through Jesus and the work done on the cross. Likewise, we ask for your mercy and grace on the NHS. In the midst of the pandemic, there has been great personal sacrifice while vaccines and treatments have been developed and bravely administered by the NHS. The government restrictions regarding COVID have eased, so we pray for your mercy and grace on the NHS personnel as they continue to be in the front line treating patients. We pray for prote protection, particularly for those who are clinically vulnerable and continue to be at great risk. So we pray for the NHS as they cope with the stress and worry of restriction easing and as they reassure their patients. Father, we are thankful for the NHS, which has made health care available to all here over seven years, 70 years. We pray for strength and endurance as the NHS faces the backlog caused by the pandemic, <clears throat> with waiting lists at an all-time high. We pray this for them as they feel the strain of trying to keep things going while there are still a lot of COVID-related staff absences. We pray too they would recognize their need for you in the midst of this. We pray for patients with their own colleagues, with their own and their colleagues' recovery, and we pray for good recovery of the whole of the NHS following such a difficult few years. Father, we also remember those in our congregation and others who are currently being treated by the NHS. In the midst of the backlog and changing schedules of appointments, we pray that they will have your peace and recognize your timing in their treatments. Heavenly Father, we also pray for protection of the mental health of our NHS personnel who have been overstretched and under extraordinary strain these last two years. We pray for them to have the rest and resources needed to not burn out. Please refresh the weary and help them to recognize your hand in this. We pray your protection on their relationships with their families, friends and colleagues, that they would be able to maintain good relationships and be supportive of each other with your help. We also pray for wisdom and guidance, particularly of those in management, as they make decisions in this post-restriction era. We pray for those planning the staffing and scheduling of them. And in the midst of this challenge, we pray that new trainees would be able to have good supervision and mentorship so that they too can be ready to give safe patient care. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many Christian brothers and sisters working in the NHS. We pray that they would continue to grow in their faithfulness to you and in their generosity of spirit, that they would be godly and able to be distinctive, full of the fruits of the spirit 
even in a pressured environment. Thank you, Father, that you've not given us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. May that be evident amongst our brothers and sisters within the NHS and without as they shine with your light. Thank you that together we can bring these petitions before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Kathy Jo. Um, Alex Hemming is going to come and read to us in a moment, and then Jonathan Rao, one of our elders, will bring God's word to us. So today's reading is from Jonah, chapter 2. We're actually starting at chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the deep, in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waves threatened me, the deep surrounded me, Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. To the earth beneath bare earth barred me in forever. But you, my Lord God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. temple. Those who cling to worthless no. idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it brought the show onto dry land. Thank you, Alex. Uh, let's just pray and then we'll turn to God's word together. Heavenly Father, we look to you this morning. We look for your spirit to be amongst, uh, amongst us and for your word to um, show us uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, today, today, I am uh, Jonathan. Uh, and I've got uh, a few things to talk you through, Jonah. Uh, chapter two this morning. Now, to start with, hopefully this will work. Um, I guess, I don't know whether you're familiar uh, with the film Jaws. Uh, I, I, it's one of the, acknowledged to be one of the greatest films ever made. Uh, it's over 40 years old, but it, it really is, a, 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 you know, a really excellent film. And it's seem to be one of the greatest films ever made and if even if you've not seen it you know don't you a bit about Jaws uh, so you know that there's always this constant menace of this shark in the water um, the, the 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 soundtrack is this you know they, they've got this this famous beating sort of soundtrack when the when the shark is in the water uh, and it really is a, an iconic piece of work and if I asked you uh, what Jaws was about what the film was about, I think most people would say, uh, well, of course, it's about a shark. The whole point is that there's this killer shark going around, gobbling up teenagers from uh, inside the sea. Um, but um, I listen sometimes to uh, Mark Kermode and Simon May on their film programme. I don't know whether everyone ever listened to that on Radio 5. It's on Friday afternoons. It's really good. And they have this kind of running gag that Simon Mayer, who's the presenter, says, well, of course, Jaws is about a shark. Uh, and Mark Kermode, who's the film critic, he, they all sort of take the mickey out of him a bit because he slightly pompously says, well, no, Jaws is not about a shark. Uh, he, he says this, Simon, uh, Mark Kermode, about Jaws. 
He says, from a Guardian review about the film, he said this, Jaws is not about a shark. It may have a shark in it, and indeed all over the poster, the soundtrack album, the paperback jacket and so on. It may have scared a generation of cinema goers to, out of the water for fear of being bitten in half by the teeth of the sea. But the underlying story of Jaws is more complex than the simple terror of being eaten by a very big fish. Jaws isn't about a shark. Apparently, according to Mark Kermode, Jaws is about a, a man uh, whose wife has had an affair and, and his life is untangling. He's a weak man who's unable to manage his family and his community uh, and sees it all crumble away. And today, we come to Jonah chapter 2. And it's not about a fish. It may have a fish in it, and indeed it may be all about over the poster, the soundtrack album, uh, the children's story Bible book cover. But the underlying story is much, much more important than the terror of being eaten by a very big fish. So what's this all about then? Well, yes, it has a fish in it, uh, and we'll look at that. The chapter is, a, a, as you can hopefully said as, as Alex read it, that uh, the chapter is a, a summary of Jonah's experience inside this big fish. But it's sort of not really about Jonah either. It's much more important than that. It's about the God behind it all. The, the, the underlying more complex story is, is not about the fish. It's not about Jonah. It's about the sovereign God of grace who reaches out to Jonah and save him. That's the point. And that's what I hope we're going to look at uh, briefly this morning. We're going to look through the response to what Jonah, uh, Jonah's response to what God does in Jonah's life that builds as it goes through to that final crescendo, if you notice in verse 9, salvation comes from the Lord. That's what this is about. How, it's all about him and how he saves. But we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. So let's recap a bit from last week. Uh, then it, um, Heather helpfully talked us a little bit about that. You, if you were here last week, Mike led us through Jonah chapter 1. And Jonah sins against God by refusing to go and preach to the Ninevites. He was so appalled that those Ninevites might actually turn to God uh, that he wanted to run away from God. And he went in the opposite direction to the way God had, had spoke, told him to go, foolishly thinking he could run away. But, of course, he couldn't. You can't run away from God, was, the, was, the, was the, the message. And God sends a great storm to punish Jonah for his sin. And he, he is thrown overboard and uh, surely drowned. Surely he's been thrown to his death uh, at the end of uh, chapter 1. And it's there that we pick this story up this morning, from the, in the belly of the great fish. Now, I started by saying that it's not about a fish, but it does have a fish in it. And I think it's important, briefly, before we talk, look at the verses, to think a little bit more about um, how we're to read this, these verses. Uh, and think about whether this is a real event that we're looking at. Lots of... Uh, discussion about this is it a real event or is it just a metaphor like a parable that is told like an allegory to, to uh, a made-up story to teach us an important spiritual lesson because to our rational scientific minds the idea of a giant fish swallowing a man and him living in there for three days just seems uh, ridiculous well I don't think we should read Jonah as an allegory I think we should read it as it is written. And there's a few reasons for that. Firstly, uh, as we saw last week, Jonah is based in time and in geography. Jonah, we saw, was a real person, uh, and he goes to real places. And the second thing is, I'm not a, an expert in these things, but Jonah is written as narrative. Jonah isn't written as, a, as, a, as an allegory. But more compellingly, um, actually, Jesus talks about Jonah in the New Testament in Matthew 12. Uh, and Jesus says these words in Matthew 12. The, the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. 
And he answers, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus, in the New Testament, likens this story to his own real resurrection. So for Jesus, when he looks at this story, this story to Jesus was real. And Jesus is God and Jesus is all-knowing. And so we can trust, if Jesus is saying this real, I think that this is what we should think of this as well. And it's important that we don't limit how God works it's not it's important to not to limit God's sovereignty remember that it might seem really strange to us that these sort of supernatural acts it's a it's talking about a miraculous sign in Matthew so it's a it's something that God does supernaturally for Jonah but remember the fact that we're here at all is a supernatural act of God the fact that Jesus was brought back from the dead that was a supernatural act And so it's really easy for the all-powerful, almighty God to work in this way. And I think perhaps we do quite well to remember that sometimes. God is is a supernatural God. He works supernaturally all the time. We believe in a God of miracles, don't we? We, we? Perhaps because we're good, logical, biblical Christians... It's easier for us to forget that God acts. God acts supernaturally, even in this world. So, we're to read this, I think, as it is written, literally. So let's look at these verses and, and what Jonah says from, from inside the great fish. And I want to look at it in two ways. Firstly, God graciously brings Jonah low. And you see in the first uh, few verses there, see Jonah cast down into the very gates of death. Um, In my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me for I was deep in the realm of the dead. He'd been hurled into the depths, into the heart, very heart of the seas and the current swirled about him and the waves and breakers swept over him. It's really striking language, isn't it? To describe a drowning man how horrible a situation that is I think if you really think about it I, I, it terrifies me frankly it's one of, I mean I don't know whether there is a, a nice way to die um, I, I guess there are relatively nicer ways to go but the idea of not being able to breathe and knowing that you are being dragged under the waves and there is no escape is terrifying and Jonah realises that, and, he, and he, you can tell from here just the, the terror of, of what had happened to him comes through. But, but notice, it's not just the terror of knowing that he's facing death. That would be bad enough. But do you notice who's done this to him? Look at verse 3. It says, you hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea. All your waves and breakers swept over me. If it's not bad enough that Jonah's got all of this anguish and that he's in this terrible situation, that the thing that's on top of it all is that it is God who has done this. It's the knowledge that it's the Lord that's held him into the sea. It's his disobedience and rejection of God that has led him to this point. And it's only at that point, when he's at his lowest, when when everything seems lost, that Jonah finally cries out to God. It's almost like, you know, that only when everything has been stripped away, only when everything has gone, that he's finally brought to the point that he needs to call out to God for help. And Jonah isn't some outlier in the course of human history that he acts like that. That's what we are like by nature. Jonah's pride is the same as ours. Jonah wanted to go his own way, not God's way. And that's exactly what all of us do. We rely on our own selves, our own understanding and our own abilities. And by nature, we would never, ever turn to God. 
We're like uh, the people in, in verse 8, uh, those who cling to worthless idols. That doesn't mean those people who necessarily have a little statue in the corner of their room. But anybody in their heart who's looking for someone other than God to, to make sense of life or to, to commit their lives to, they're, they're being idolatrous. They're putting something else in the place that God should be. If you're not a Christian, that's what you are doing by default. Someone else is in God's place. And even if you are a Christian, uh, as I know many of us are here, perhaps it's tempting for us to still replace God, look to replace God with something else, uh, our pride, our own ability to look for security in other things, whatever it is. And Jonah and God strips these things away from Jonah. Quite brutally, really, doesn't it? And it seems that Jonah, God might be seen being harsh and unloving to Jonah. You might think Jonah doesn't deserve all this bad luck. And God is just being mean. But the point is, God, in the way he acts with Jonah, is being gracious and loving to him. Because that's what it takes for him to strip everything away in order that Jonah would trust him. I don't know whether you've had to do this, but uh, if, if you see two children fighting over a toy, uh, and people, and you, you know when people really grab hold of something, uh, and you know, maybe your parents' parenting sort of uh, skills desert you completely, and in the end, all you've got is two people really trying to grab hold of something, and they are not going to be the person who lets go. Right? And you perhaps have to sort of, I don't know, peel off finger by finger uh, because there's just no response to it. And you have to sort of, you know, eventually grapple with it to get that toy off. And sometimes that's the way the Lord is with us. Sometimes the way that's Lord, the way the Lord has to deal with us. It's not good enough to say, well, we'll leave one thing in our lives that I can cling on to and then I'll try and sort of cling on to God as well. We would be like that child. God has to take everything away from us in order for him to be our Lord and for him to be able to work in our lives. That's what he did with Jonah. God loves us too much to leave us to ruin ourselves. So even if in love, sometimes he brings us low. He teaches those things. It's like he's stripping back the old paint in order that he might paint something wonderful uh, in its place. And what will God have to do for us in order to show us how silly we are? What, it, it, perhaps it's good to examine ourselves to see, is there anything in our lives that the Spirit is prompting us to think that we need to strip away in order that God can work. Because God is sovereign and he is merciful, even in this, even in bringing us low, even in teaching us hard things. He's sovereign and he's merciful. And that's what he was showing to Jonah, even in that, in Jonah's distress. important for us to sit and think in our own lives if you've never come to Jesus before what are you holding on to that stops you coming to him that that stops him that he will need to strip away before he can work in your life and, and as Christians what what is it that you're now holding on to and pray that that he won't have to intervene in your life anything like uh, the example that we have here before he can work So that's the first thing in these verses. Jonah, God brings Jonah low. But this isn't a nasty kind of uncaring God. He brings him low in order, to, the second thing, to raise him up, to bring him up. And Mike talked a little bit about that, this language last week, if you remember, that, you know, God, um, uh, he... Um, he, he um, went, goes down to Joppa, he goes down into the fish. There's a sort of almost depressing kind of quality to the language here. But then look at verse 7. Uh, 
Jonah, even from the, from the depths, his prayer rises to the Lord and to his holy temple. And in verse 2, God listens to his cry. And then in verse 6, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. Jonah's cries aren't unanswered. Jonah cries out, but God listens and God acts. God doesn't say Jonah deserves it. God doesn't say, uh, oh, well, it's too late now, Jonah. He doesn't wait for Jonah to change to be a better person. God listens and God asks, acts and God rescues. And he couldn't do that if he weren't a sovereign God. And he wouldn't do that were he not uh, gracious and compassionate. But salvation comes from God. As Jonah's life is at an end, as he cries out to God, God comes and provides salvation for Jonah and, and he sends the big fish. So he's brought low in order to bring him up high. And it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, when you read these verses, that it's perhaps not the prayer that you think it is from your children's Bibles. Let me explain that. So, so sometimes, I don't, know, I don't know about you, but sometimes you kind of think that when you read it in kind of children's Bible terms, that what happens is God sends the fish almost to teach Jonah a lesson and that Jonah's there to kind of work things out and sort of say the magic words and only when he's got to a certain point that kind of God lets him off the hook and he comes out of the fish. But that's not the order of things here. Jonah is in the belly of the fish. His problems aren't over, certainly, are they? But he has already been rescued. It's the fish that's been provided for him that is the rescue. He's already been saved at this point when he's in the fish. And that's remarkable, isn't it? And what the fish does, it allows him always the time to think and reflect and really understand what it is that the Lord's done uh, in his life. And it's clearly given him time to think uh, about what really has happened to him. He knows that the Lord has done this. In verse two, again, we've talked about it. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me from the deep, from the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listen to my cry. The God of mercy hears this pitiful cry from this drowning man. And again, this isn't just a one-off for God, is it? This is showing us what God is like. This is showing us this is not about the fish, this is about a sovereign, gracious God. And that, the theme that we see here is repeated again and again throughout scripture, page after page, from the Garden of Eden to the seven churches in Revelation. God's people reject him. He corrects them and brings them back. And they, they cry to him in their distress and he rescues them. That's the pattern, that's the gospel, that's the good news that we see here. Instead of drowning, Jonah gets life. And instead of judgment, he receives mercy and more than that he's lifted up into relationship with God more than that instead of idols he gets God look again at verse 8 it says that those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them it's comparing these two ways of living and we've talked about this before that that you know on the one hand Jonah was clinging to these idols and um, it's contrasting that, that what, if you have the idols, you're turning away from all that God has for you. Again, it's God's nature to be loving. He's gracious, he's compassionate, and he's abounding in love. It's more love than we can ever know. And not only does God not punish Jonah, but he... Uh, restores him and he can't wait to bless him and he can't wait to bless us 
if we cry out to him, even though we deserve nothing. There's a choice. There's either clinging to, clinging to our idols or turning back to the God of love. We deserve what, what, what Jonah got, don't we? We, reserve, we deserve punishment for rejecting God. And then we compound our folly by uh, believing in ourselves and looking for our own strength. And in God, in his sovereign mercy and love, has to show us the end of all that. But then God, in his grace, also provides us with a way of salvation. When we cry out to him, he, the promise to Jonah, what happened to Jonah, is what happens to us when we cry to him. Not only does he rescue us, but he lifts us up. Uh, and there's a verse that says about, in verse 7, that he's lifting up luck to his holy temple and being restored in verse 4. To, to God's holy temple, lifted up into relationship with him. So we're not just forgiven, we are restored by God. And we can be in his presence and have that great joy of, of walking with him as a child and being blessed by him again and again. Jonah sees not, not only that he's been saved from death but he's been restored and he will see God's face so what's this way of salvation for us what if you like what's if uh, the miracle in Jonah's story was the great fish what is our miracle what what is our miracle that that saves us today let's see if this goes back there we go it does well, let's go back, if you're still with me, into Matthew chapter 12. Clearly, in this story, that you can, if you've got any sort of Bible knowledge, you can see that this story is pointing to something bigger, and that's Jesus. And it's really clear from what Jesus himself says in Matthew 12, uh, what's going on here. For it's a sign, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Our miracle is, is a greater miracle. That God in Jesus became a man. That unbelievably he died in our place. That supernaturally he was raised from death by God. To show that death was defeated. That's our miracle. That's what God provides for us to save us. And it's so much greater than a, than a big fish. It's so much more implausible than a great fish. But it's true. A metaphorical resurrection saves nobody, does it? It has to be real. And it is. God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Our sinfulness is, is as bad as Jonah's. Our, our punishment should be just as severe. But yet, if we cry out to him, as, as I know most of us here this morning know, there is forgiveness, full and free for you and for me. And we can be saved for, from death and for, from judgment. And we can be restored to this new life of joy with him. Salvation comes from the Lord. And finally then, briefly, let's just think about how Jonah responds to, to all these things, to being brought low and the thought of then being saved and being raised back up again by God. All this, the whole thing here is, is really a, it's a summary retelling. It's not, a, it's not a, like a direct copy of exactly every word that Jonah said in order. It's a summary of what Jonah thought as he was in the fish. And it's a glorious kind of retelling of all the things that God has done for him. And his response is one of, of wonderful praise in the end. Verse 9 is, is a wonderful sort of crown to the whole chapter isn't it i with shouts of grateful praise will sacrifice to you 
What I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And we would do well uh, to, to follow Jonah's example, I think. How often I worry about the circumstances that I'm in, that, that being in the belly of the fish, that life is hard, although for me it's not really. Uh, you know, we concentrate on the challenges, don't we? We concentrate on our circumstances. How much more profitable is it to do what Jonah's done and, and to look back and reflect and think about God's dealings, gracious dealings with them? To mark and remember God's hand through our lives, to, to remember his great love for us, how he's uh, kept his promises to us in the past and how his promises are that he will never forsake us in the future. We do well to reflect like Jonah does uh, in these verses. But really, the, the only response to such mercy that we've seen here is, is, is to sing, to, to praise and to worship God, because God alone has turned our hearts from, from rejection to obedience, turned our, our minds from, from anger to praise. Salvation comes from the Lord. That This is a glorious ending, a glorious proclamation that, that it's all about God. Glorious truth that, that where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So, it's not about a fish. Uh, it's not really about Jonah. Uh, it's really not about you or me. It's about him. It's about God. Uh, a sovereign, gracious, wonderful God who hears our calls and answers them and brings us up out of the pit. It's all about him from, from beginning to end. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Let's sing now of the miracle of salvation in the words of our final song, Salvation Belongs to Our God. <clears throat> standing as we say the words of the grace together. Do stay around for tea and coffee after the service. It's a lovely way to continue the informal part of our meeting together. But let's say the words of the grace now. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with us all evermore.